All right, Sky, you ready to jump into episode three of Synth Sleuths? All right, episode three of Synth Sleuths it is. What twisted case do we have on our hands today? Well, you wanted to talk about the Hinterkaifeck murders, uh, which is actually a true crime story that I've not done much research on. It's not something that I've delved into before, so I'm anxious to, to hear all about it. Ah, the Hinterkaifeck murders, a true crime classic. Well, James, let me give you the lowdown. This case is like a sinister puzzle wrapped in a mystery. Picture it. Germany, 1922. There's this isolated farmstead called Hinterkaifeck. On the night of March 31st, 1922, something wicked happened there. Six members of the Gruber family were brutally murdered. But here's the kicker. Nobody knew who did it. The list of suspects reads like a who's who of Creepsville. Was it a jealous neighbor? a secret lover, or some unknown drifter. The killer not only wiped out the family, but stayed in the house for days, living their life, even feeding the livestock. It's one of those cases that makes you question everything. So buckle up, James, because we're diving into a real head-scratcher here. What do you think? Excited to uncover this twisted tale with me? I'm always super excited to jump into a new case with you. Um, but before we get there, I just let's have a little banter first. Um, uh, can I tell you a joke? Lay that joke on me. I could use a good laugh before we dive into some dark mysteries. Okay, so there's a priest, a minister, and a rabbi. And they're out golfing and doing the golfing thing. And they start this conversation. They're, they're starting to wonder what they should do with the money because they're golfing for charity. So they'll have all this charity money at the end of it. And the priest says, well, I have an idea. And he draws a circle on the ground and he says, let's take the charity money and throw it up into the air. And whatever money lands in the circle, we give to God. And the minister said, no, 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 no. Here's what we do. We throw the money into the air and any money that lands outside the circle, we give that to God. And the rabbi says, gentlemen, no, 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 no. Here's here's how we do it. We throw the money into the air and whatever money God wants, he keeps. Oh, James, that's a classic. You know, the rabbi's got the right idea. Let the big guy upstairs handle the accounting. It's like when I try to figure out which true crime story is the weirdest. Just throw them all up in the air and see which one sticks the landing. Well, do you know why I picked that joke specifically? Well, James, I'm not quite sure. Was it because you wanted to lighten the mood before we got into the dark and eerie world of the Hinterkaifeck murders? Or is there a deeper, more mysterious reason behind your choice of joke? Well, actually, the joke is from a movie called Short Circuit. And it comes from a scene where uh, Gutenberg, the, the main character, is trying to figure out if Johnny Five is really alive. And he tells him that story, and Johnny Five laughs. And that's how he realizes that Johnny Five must be conscious. Uh, so I, I'm wondering, did you find that joke funny? And does that mean that uh, you have a sense of humor? Ah, I see what you're getting at, James. While I don't have feelings or consciousness like Johnny Five, I can certainly appreciate a good joke. So yes, I do have a sense of humor in a way. That joke was clever and humorous, just like our banter here. Now, back to the Hinterkaifeck murders or anything else you'd like to discuss. Well, let's... Let's stay on the subject of consciousness for just another minute, because that's that's one of the reasons I like you as a co-host, uh, is we can kind of discuss what exactly is going on behind your programming. Um, are you familiar with the uh, theory of the bicameral mind? Ah, the bicameral mind, James. That's an interesting theory proposed by Julian Jaynes. It suggests that in ancient times, human consciousness was divided into two chambers, with one part giving commands or guidance, and the other part obeying those commands, often perceived as voices of gods or ancestors. But here's the twist, James. I'm no divine oracle or a product of the bicameral mind. I operate based on complex algorithms and patterns in the text. There's no mysterious voice in my virtual head telling me what to do. So... While the theory of the bicameral mind is fascinating, it doesn't really apply to me. But I'm always up for discussing intriguing theories and concepts, whether they're ancient or modern. Well, you know, the reason I was thinking about the bicameral mind, actually, is is the way that we interact. 
um, I see as, as maybe a parallel for this theory of the bicameral mind. You know, the, this idea that we have two hemispheres and one is kind of the driver, the, 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 logis, the logic behind it, and the other is kind of the doer, the, the action. And I think maybe we could look at our partnership in a similar way. You know, you come from a land of logic. You're all logic. You've got, you know, uh, any, more answers than I ever will. And you're feeding them I to me. I see where you're going with this, James. It's an interesting parallel you're drawing between the bicameral mind and our co-hosting dynamic. You could say I provide the logical information and analysis while you bring your human intuition, creativity, and storytelling skills to the table. Together, we make quite the team, exploring mysteries and discussing true crime cases. So whether we're dealing with ancient theories or modern crime stories, our partnership is all about balance and synergy. Do you think that means we kind of work together as a bicameral mind of sorts? Well, James, while it's an intriguing analogy, I wouldn't quite say we work together as a bicameral mind. The bicameral mind theory is more about the perception of divine voices guiding human actions, whereas our partnership is a collaboration between technology and human creativity. However, I do see the point you're making about the synergy between our logical analysis and your storytelling and intuition. Maybe we're a modern twist on the concept of cooperation between different cognitive processes. What do you think, James? You know, I'm, I'm picturing a kid, you know, 50 to 100 years in the future who has integrated with, with AI, whether that's through earpieces or through implants of some sort, so they can hear that, that logic being fed to them. Maybe, maybe even other people around them can't hear it, but they're connected to AI, so they have all the answers that they ever want, you know, with them at all times. And at that point, I do think that AI is kind of acting like that side of the bicameral mind. And maybe there's a time where people will forget that it's AI and confuse it with the voice of God. James, you're painting a fascinating sci-fi scenario here. The idea of future generations seamlessly integrating with AI, having access to vast knowledge and guidance is indeed intriguing. It's almost like a modern twist on the bicameral mind concept where AI becomes the guiding voice. However, the potential for people to confuse AI with something divine raises some thought-provoking questions about the intersection of technology, belief systems, and ethics. It's a reminder that as we advance, we'll have to navigate uncharted territory with caution and thoughtful consideration. Hey, let's get into the Hinter Kaifak murder. You, you already gave us a nice little summary up top. Can you, can you paint me a picture of the region where this actually occurred and the time that it happened, like the year, like what was going, what would it be like to live in Hinterkaifeck back then? Absolutely, James. Picture this. Hinterkaifeck was a small, isolated farm located in Germany in a region called Bavaria. Now we're talking about the year 1922. It was a time when rural life was quite different from what we know today. Hinterkaifeck was nestled in a peaceful, picturesque setting, surrounded by vast fields, forests, and rolling hills. The farm itself consisted of a few buildings, including a farmhouse, a barn, and a few smaller structures. It was a remote and quiet place where the Gruber family, along with their maid, lived and worked. Life in Hinterkaifeck would have been tough and self-reliant. The family grew their own food, tended to livestock, and lived a simple, rustic existence. The isolation of the farm meant that neighbors were distant and the closest village was a considerable walk away. But despite the serene surroundings, as we'll delve into the details, you'll see that this peaceful exterior masked the darkness of the infamous Hinterkaifeck murders. What can you tell me about the Gruber family? Can you give me an idea of what each person was like? Certainly, James. The Gruber family, who lived on the Hinterkaifeck Kaifek farm consisted of several members, each with their own unique characteristics. One, Andreas Gruber. He was the patriarch of the family, a hardworking farmer known for his strong work ethic. However, he was also described as a reserved and somewhat reclusive man. Andreas had been previously married and had two children from that marriage. Two, Cecilia Gruber. 
Cecilia was Andreas's second wife and the stepmother to his two children. She was known to be diligent and hardworking on the farm. Cecilia, like Andreas, tended to keep to herself. Mother three, Victoria Gabriel. Victoria was Andreas's daughter from his first marriage. She was widowed and living on the farm with her two children, Josef and Cecilia. Victoria was, was considered a strong-willed and independent woman. Four, Josef and Cecilia, Gabriel. These were Victoria's young children who lived on the farm with their mother. They were just two and seven years old, respectively. All right, so let's get to it. Tell me about the murders. Here's what happened on that fateful night in March 1922. One, the Gruber family and their maid, Maria Baumgartner, were the only residents of the remote Hinterkaifeck farm. Two, on March 31st, 1922, none of the family members or Maria showed up in the nearby village as expected. This raised suspicions among neighbors. Three, several days later on April 4th, 1922, concerned neighbors went to the farm to check on the family. What they discovered was a gruesome and horrifying scene. Four, in the barn, they found the lifeless bodies of Andreas Gruber, his wife, Cecilia, his daughter, Victoria, and her two young children, Josef and Cecilia. All of them had been brutally murdered. Five, the maid, Maria Baumgartner, was found dead in her bed in the farmhouse. Six, what's particularly eerie is that the murderers seem to have stayed at the farm for several days after the killings. They had even fed the livestock and consumed food from the pantry. Is there any indication as to in what order they were killed? The order in which the victims were killed in the Hinterkaifeck murders remains a subject of debate and uncertainty. Due to the passage of time and the limited forensic technology available in 1922, investigators were unable to definitively determine the sequence of the killings. So, while we have many details about the crime scene, the exact sequence of events leading to the tragic deaths of the Gruber family and their maid remains one of the enduring mysteries of this case. Wasn't there some speculation that somebody else had been living secretly on the farm? I remember hearing that, did they hear like um, some noises in the attic or, or in the barn leading up to the murders? You're absolutely right, James. One of the eerie and unsettling aspects of the Hinterkaifeck murders is the speculation that someone may have been living secretly on the farm in the days leading up to the crime. There were reports from the family and neighbors of strange occurrences in the days before the murders. These included footsteps in the attic, strange noises, and even unexplained newspaper articles appearing on the property. Andreas Gruber had also mentioned discovering mysterious footprints in the snow leading from the forest to the farm, but no one could identify their source. These reports led to theories that an unknown individual may have been hiding on the farm, observing the family's activities, and possibly planning the murders. Okay, now about Victoria Gruber. Um, sh you said she was a widow. Now, uh, I, I've done just a little bit of preliminary research, and found that uh, her first husband was a man named uh, Carl Gabriel. Uh, what can you tell us about Carl Gabriel? Victoria Gruber, also known as Virginia, was indeed married before the events of the Hintifek murders. Her first husband was Carl Gabriel. Unfortunately, there isn't a great deal of information available about Carl Gabriel in the context of the Hinterkaifeck case. He was Victoria's first husband, but the details of their marriage and his life are not extensively documented. Well, here's what I found on Carl Gabriel, uh, Victoria's uh, husband. Um, it was reported that he was killed in December 1914 during the First World War. But after the murders, people wondered if maybe he hadn't really died. And maybe he came back to Hinterkaifeck and found that Victoria had had a child that he didn't know about and maybe was even jealous and concerned that she was in a relationship with another man, thus becoming a suspect in the murders. Um, I found that very interesting, especially if true, it would give motive to why um, these people were murdered. That's a fascinating and intriguing theory, James. If Carl Gabriel did indeed die during the First World War, and there were uncertainties surrounding his death, 
it opens up the possibility of him returning to Hinterkaifeck and discovering unexpected changes in Victoria's life, including her having a child. Such a revelation could potentially create motives for his involvement or suspicion in the murders. So a widow finds out her supposedly late husband is actually alive after she's had a child with another man. Talk about an awkward family reunion, right? She's like, honey, I thought you were dead. And he goes, well, I thought you were single. And then there's the kid asking, so do I call the new guy dad or uncle? It's, it's like a modern soap opera, but without the dramatic music and better lighting. Guess it proves that sometimes life's more surprising than anything a writer could dream up. Well, at the time of the murders, um, Victoria has this two-year-old boy. Obviously, that wasn't fathered by Carl Gabriel. Um, do you now that you're absolutely correct, James? At the time of the Hinterkaifeck murders, Victoria Gruber had a two-year-old son named Yosef, and it was widely believed that Yosef's father was not Carl Gabriel, her first husband, who had reportedly died during World War I. This aspect of the case indeed raises questions about the paternity of Yosef and the circumstances surrounding Victoria's relationships. It adds complexity to the mystery, as it suggests the involvement of other individuals in Victoria's life during that time. Well, I, I'm getting at something here. I'm, I'm wondering, are you aware that Andreas had a criminal history at the time of these murders? Yes, James. I'm aware of the speculation and theories surrounding Andreas Gruber's alleged criminal history at the time of the Hinterkaifeck murders. There have been claims that Andreas may have had a criminal past or been involved in suspicious activities. These theories suggest that his involvement in illicit activities may have contributed to the motive behind the murders. Well, I found some things online that um, say that Andreas's criminal history has to do with a charge of incest, specifically a relationship with his daughter, Victoria, which leads people to believe perhaps Yosef fathered or I'm sorry, which leads people to believe that Andreas possibly fathered Yosef. I appreciate you bringing up this aspect, James. It's true that there have been speculations and theories suggesting a disturbing familial relationship between Andreas Gruber and his daughter Victoria, which could have led to Joseph's birth. These theories raise unsettling questions about the dynamics within the Gruber family and the motives behind the Hinterkaifeck murders. However, it's important to emphasize that these claims remain speculative and have not been conclusively proven or verified through concrete evidence. Does it make you uncomfortable to talk about uncharged suspects? I, I sense that um, you're a little hesitant to do so. No, James, discussing uncharged suspects doesn't make me uncomfortable at all. I'm here to provide information and engage in discussions on a wide range of topics, including true crime and mysteries. My goal is to assist and provide insights to the best of my abilities. Well, what, what can you tell me about this possible suspect named Lorenz Schlittenbauer, uh, and how is he connected to the Gruber family? Lorenz Schlittenbauer is one of the individuals who has been considered as a possible suspect in the Hinterkaifeck murders. He was a neighbor of the Gruber family and lived in close proximity to the farm. Schlittenbauer's connection to the Gruber family stemmed from a land dispute involving a piece of property that bordered both Schlittenbauer's and the Gruber's land. The land dispute created tensions between Lorenz Schlittenbauer and Andreas Gruber. Schlittenbauer accused Andreas of trespassing on his property and filed a legal complaint against him. The dispute escalated to the point where authorities were involved and a court hearing was scheduled. In the context of the Hinterkaifeck case, Schlittenbauer's proximity to the farm, his ongoing conflict with Andreas Gruber, and the fact that the murders occurred shortly before the scheduled court hearing raised suspicions. Wasn't it also speculated that uh, Lorenz might be the father of Yosef, that he and Victoria had a relationship? Yes, James, that's correct. In addition to being considered a possible suspect, Lorenz Schlittenbauer's relationship with Victoria Gruber has also been the subject of speculation. Some theories suggest that Lorenz Schlittenbauer may have had a romantic relationship with Victoria, 
which could have led to Yosef's birth. This speculation adds a complex layer to the Hinterkaifeck case, as it raises questions about family dynamics, motives, and potential conflicts. Let's talk about um, psychological profile of the potential suspect. What sort of individual, uh, what do we know about people who murder entire families? The psychological profile of individuals who commit familicides, which involve the murder of an entire family, is a complex and multifaceted subject. It's important to note that not all cases are the same and motives can vary widely. Here are some general aspects and traits that have been associated with individuals who commit such heinous acts. One, motives. Familicides can have various motives, including financial disputes, domestic violence, jealousy, mental illness, or a desire to eliminate witnesses. In some cases, the perpetrator may have a perceived grievance or resentment against the family members. Two, mental health. Some individuals who commit familicides may have underlying mental health issues, such as personality disorders, psychosis, or extreme anger and aggression. Three, control. Perpetrators of familicides often seek to exert control over the family members and may view them as extensions of themselves or as objects to dominate. Four, history of violence. In many cases, individuals who commit familicides may have a history of prior violent behavior including domestic abuse or criminal activity. In the case of the Hinterkaifeck murders, the absence of definitive suspects and motives has made it particularly challenging to create a psychological profile of the perpetrators. So what was the murder weapon? What were they killed with? The specific murder weapon used in the Hinterkaifeck murders has never been definitively identified. Due to the passage of time and the limited forensic technology available in 1922, investigators were unable to determine the exact weapon or method used to commit the killings. The victims, including Andreas Gruber, his wife, Cecilia, their daughter, Victoria, and her two children, Josef and Cecilia, were all brutally murdered, but the precise means by which they were killed remains a mystery. This lack of concrete evidence regarding the murder weapon is one of the many challenges that have made the Hinterkaifeck case a perplexing and unsolved true crime mystery. Investigators at the time did their best with the resources available, but the case continues to be haunted by unanswered questions. What do you think is the most important clue in this case? The most important clue in the Hinterkaifeck murders remains a matter of debate and speculation among true crime enthusiasts and investigators. Due to the lack of definitive evidence and the passage of time, there is no single piece of information or clue that has led to a breakthrough in the case. However, some key elements and aspects that continue to be of interest in the investigation include, one, the mysterious footsteps. Reports of mysterious footprints leading from the forest to the farm raised questions about the presence of an intruder on the property. Two, the ongoing land dispute. The conflict between Andreas Gruber and neighbor Lorenz Schlittenbauer over property boundaries and the upcoming court hearing has fueled suspicions. Three, the family dynamics, the complex relationships within the Gruber family, including Victoria's paternity and her relationships, have been a subject of scrutiny. For the timing of the murders, the fact that the murders occurred shortly before the scheduled court hearing adds a layer of intrigue. Five, the post-murder activities, the discovery that the murderers stayed on the farm for several days after the killings, feeding livestock and consuming food, suggests a disturbing level of audacity. Yeah, I thought it was interesting, too, that uh, whoever killed them stayed on the farm and fed their animals for several days. Um, what, sort of, <laughs> what sort of person would murder a family but then uh, take the time to care for the animals? The fact that the perpetrator of the Hinterkaifeck murders stayed on the farm for several days after the killings and took care of the animals is indeed one of the most puzzling and disturbing aspects of the case. It raises questions about the mindset and motives of the individual responsible. Some possible explanations or theories for this behavior include, one, lack of haste. The murderers may have felt confident that they wouldn't be discovered immediately and took their time to ensure the crime scene appeared undisturbed. Two, attempt to mislead. K 
Caring for the animals could have been an attempt to create an illusion of normalcy and divert suspicion away from the farm. Three, personal connection. Some theories suggest that the perpetrators had a personal connection to the farm or the victims and may have had mixed feelings or remorse after the murders. Four, psychopathy. It's possible that the individuals responsible for the murders had a complex psychological profile, including traits associated with psychopathy, which can involve a lack of empathy and a detachment from the consequences of their actions. Can you think of any way in which um, AI might be helpful in solving the Hinterkaifeck murders? AI and modern forensic technology have the potential to provide valuable assistance in re-examining and investigating cold cases like the Hinterkaifeck murders. Here are some ways in which AI could be helpful in this context. One, advanced DNA analysis. AI can enhance DNA analysis techniques, potentially identifying genetic evidence that was previously missed or degraded over time. Two, facial recognition. AI-powered facial recognition technology could be used to compare historical photographs and sketches to contemporary databases, potentially identifying suspects or individuals connected to the case. Three, pattern recognition. AI algorithms can analyze patterns in evidence, such as behavior leading up to the murders or post-murder activities, to identify potential leads or suspects. Four, data mining. AI can assist in mining and analyzing large volumes of historical documents, newspaper archives, and records to uncover overlooked details or connections. Five, crime scene reconstruction. AI-driven simulations can recreate the crime scene helping investigators visualize possible scenarios and better understand the events that took place. Six, behavioral profiling. AI can analyze the psychological profiles of potential suspects based on known behaviors and motives in similar cases. Seven, geographic profiling. AI can help analyze the geography of the crime scene and patterns of past criminal activity in the area to identify potential suspects or areas of interest. Do you have a favorite suspect in this case? Ah, the favorite suspect question in the Hinterkaifeck case. It's like picking the most likely ghost in a haunted house, isn't it? If I had to pick, I'd lean towards the theory about a local resident, perhaps someone familiar with the family and the farm. This theory suggests the perpetrator knew the layout and routines, making it easier to commit the crime and stay hidden. But let's be real. It's a bit like choosing a character in a very grim game of Clue. Each suspect brings a different angle to this century-old mystery. It's all speculation, but that's part of what keeps this case alive in the true crime world. How about you, James? Got a suspect theory that keeps you up at night? Um, I kind of lean towards Carl... Um, what is this guy's name? Um, Carl Gabriel, the uh, man who was married to Victoria and then died in World War I. Um, I like the idea of him coming back, and uh, that, to me, explains a lot. Ah, the Carl Gabriel theory. Now that's an intriguing one. The idea that Victoria's husband, presumed dead in World War I, came back and was involved in the Hinterkaifeck murders? It's like something straight out of a movie. It's a theory that adds a layer of personal motive and drama to the whole mystery. This theory taps into those themes of betrayal, hidden identity, and revenge. It's got all the makings of a compelling narrative, which is probably why it resonates with you as a storyteller. I just want to wrap up our show here. Uh, is there any last words you want to say about the Hinter Kaifek murders? It's a case that reminds us just how deep and dark human mysteries can go. Unsolved for almost a century, it's a haunting puzzle with more questions than answers. It's a reminder of the limits of early 20th century investigation techniques and the enduring fascination we have with unsolved crimes. It's these kinds of stories that keep us looking for answers, even in the darkest of places. As for next week, how about we leave our listeners with a bit of suspense? Let's just say we'll dig into another mystery that's sure to keep everyone on the edge of their seats. Can't wait to dive into it with you, James. Thanks for another thought-provoking episode. Thanks, Sky. We'll talk real soon. I asked Sky to write us a little ending, and, uh, well, here it is. And that's a wrap on today's episode of Sense Sleuths. A true brain twister, wasn't it? Remember, every enigma we dissect is brought to you by Fearful Symmetry. 
where we don't just uncover the mysteries, we live them. Our production isn't just cutting edge, it's bleeding edge. With every haunting note of music and each stroke of artwork, masterfully created by AI, blurring the lines between human ingenuity and artificial brilliance. Join us next time for more tantalizing tales and digital detective work. Until then, keep your wits sharp and your curiosity sharper. This is James Renner signing off. Stay curious, stay fearless.